Um, so we're very fortunate to have two central leaders of mindfulness and education with us here today. They're Dr. Craig Hazard and Richard Chambers from Monash University. And sorry, Craig, if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. I meant to ask, is that right, Hazard? Yes, that's yes. it. Dr. Hazard is a general practitioner and senior lecturer at Monash University of General Practice. His teaching, research, and clinical interests include mindfulness-based stress reduction, management, mind-body medicine, meditation, health promotion, intricative medicine, and medical ethics. He likes to practice his attentional skills on good red wine, practice his, his acceptance by being a Richmond supporter, and practice taking one step at a time while running at 5.30 a.m. most mornings. Dr. Chambers is a clinical psychologist in private practice specializing in mindfulness-based therapies. He also works as a consultant at Monash where he is involved in developing a university-wide mindfulness program. He's also one of the developers of the Smiling Mind app, and there's information about that on your handouts. Um, and he describes himself as being most mindful when canoeing in the Blue Mountains. As he told me, there's nothing like abseiling a 30-metre waterfall into a freezing pool to bring you into the moment. <laughs> um, Dr. Hazard and Dr. Chambers are co-authors of the recently published Mindful Learning, Reduce Stress and Improve brain, brain, brain Performance for Effective Learning, which has just come out this year, and it's a fantastic resource. Um, I don't know if you did it, but I asked them to bring copies of their book. Um, so it'll be for sale here at the symposium. So um, please welcome Craig and Richard. For Richard and I to develop programs and to deliver things, but unless you've got people in high places who can actually create the, um, the space for that to, to happen, it's not going to happen. So I'd like to acknowledge that, although we're speaking, there's a lot of people to be um, thankful for. What we're going to, um, to do in this time is to give you a bit of an overview of uh, what's happening in the mindfulness and meditation space at, at Monash University. Uh, so I think we're at uh, a great moment in, uh, in evolution of, uh, of education more generally, but uh, <laughs> and certainly medical practice as well. And uh, it's a very exciting time in a way. Um, so what we'll um, uh, look at today, just briefly, the history of mindfulness at Monash, the evolution of programs and how they get integrated. Uh, some of the programs that are offered, so we'll give you, and as you can see, there's a wide variety of uh, groups, not just in, say, medicine, for example, where the integrated programs uh, started, but a whole range of other programs. We'll give you a, a brief overview of those. Um, a bit about communicating the message. Um, so, not because this is the correct way to communicate the message, but I guess this is, uh, say, born from experience of what's been found to be helpful in communicating a message. Just mentioning about enjoying red wine, you stand up in a room full of lawyers, we were just chatting before, and uh, what's this mindfulness bit? Well, you ask if any of them enjoy red wine, um, a sea of hands will go up. Where's your attention when you're tasting your red wine? You're fully engaged with the sense of taste and smell, and uh, well, they're practicing mindfulness, so it's just in a different form. Now we just translate that attentiveness that they bring to wine to other aspects of life. It's just different ways of communicating a message in different audiences, but we'll give you a bit of a sense of perhaps some of our learning from that. The big vision, so the mindful university. So what could a university be like? And, uh, and we'll have hopefully some time for discussion as well. And there's also, I think, a panel later on in the day. Um, so let you know the scope of what we're offering, how we went about it, um, political, administrative, and financial considerations, help with arguing the case and communicating the message, and ultimately helping you to integrate mindfulness programs at your university or workplace. Now, just very briefly, the history. Um, in terms of my own um, personal experience, I, I, I guess I had my first taste of mindfulness meditation as a disillusioned 19-year-old medical student, what to do, and, you know, <laughs> you know, you know. And I just thought, I'd, for some reason, sitting in a chair still and uh, just watching um, would be useful. I don't know why I thought that as a 19-year-old semi-depressed, uh, disillusioned medical student, but, um, but I did. I sat in a chair and just watched without any attempt to change how I felt, but I thought, just sitting and watching, I might learn something. I sat in that chair for a long time, and it, when I got out of that chair, I totally changed my perspective. You know, and 
the relationship to thoughts and feelings and mind and non-attachment and so on, that all of this stuff was just on the surface and had nothing to do with what I was underneath all of that. That sort of experience, I suppose, transformative, intuitive experience for me, sowed a very deep seed. Uh, and as a medical student, in terms of health, the mind and the body, how obviously they were related, I felt that this was the most important single thing that you could contribute to health and well-being. So for me, that was sort of pretty much setting the direction for my future medical education and so on. But um, uh, when I sort of thought of what direction in my career, I've been out working for a few years, I felt that these kinds of things should be taught. And I can remember thinking that you know, this, this should be taught you know, in medical school. Somebody should do something about that. And the next thought was that I noticed, go on, do something about it. <laughs> and um, I thought, well, this is the last thing in the world I wanted to do, was to go into academia. But um, I thought, well, OK, well, somebody should do something about it. So making the step into uh, medical education and starting to work at Monash since 1989. And at that time, there wasn't a template for introducing these kinds of things. Um, but uh, um, over the following couple of years, and uh, there was, I guess, developing uh, a language and a rationale that made sense for me. To t and I was interested in the philosophy and the spiritual aspects of it because it had sort of, in the years since my teenage years and my sort of late 20s, it had evolved in that way. But that wasn't the language that people spoke in medical school. That wasn't the language of Journal Club. Well, what was the language? It was the language of science and clinical application and stress and so on. So that was really the language that was necessary. The first optional programs at lunchtime um, for medical students and so on, so starting to teach that, and there was a big response from the medical students. Uh, and coincidentally, at that time, the faculty did a student wellbeing survey. And uh, they got in the data and found the students were stressed out of their brains. Well, I could have told them that, but anyway, they <laughs> discovered. And all of a sudden, they're looking around in the faculty, who's doing anything with stress management and so on? Oh, Craig Hassett's running some programs. Would you actually take some programs for the students in core curriculum? Synchronicity, you can't beat it, all right? So anyway, we, we went from there. And so two hour sessions, this was the first sort of step into core curriculum. And uh, about that time, I was developing a program to train GPs in, in meditation-based stress management. So using that as a foundation for cognitive skills and how to manage stress and help with depression and so on. So that, was, that program was being developed at the same time and, in, in, um, and started in the, uh, in the uh, College of GPs. And then we adapted that program for the medical students. So in 92, we started to offer that as an elective. And again, it was a very popular elective. Then what happened next, um, limited core curriculum, so two hour workshop um, in year one, one hour lecture in year two, um, and then uh, the elective program. And then two, 2000, new medical curriculum being developed. Uh, developing a new curriculum, window of opportunity. I was on every curriculum committee, everything I'd get involved with to find a way of integrating this more deeply into the curriculum. And uh, so in the, the um, personal and professional development theme, the case was put, and it was a supportive thing group, that the students' own mental health and wellbeing needed to be a core objective of the training. And I'll give you a bit of a sense of why. So we had 5% of the first year curriculum time to integrate a, a, series, a program, lectures, and tutorials, and so on. And this was core curriculum, and it had to be examinable. All right? Examinable as any other part of the curriculum in proportion to the curriculum time. It's reinforced in other parts of the, um, the curriculum as well. Um, it was interesting that in 2005 I'd gone across, I'd, I'd done a leadership in academic medicine program that Harvard had run in Australia, it was actually in the Blue Mountains, um, and, um, and the people from Harvard said, oh, you're teaching this in the curriculum, you should come across, oh, you're coming to Boston, you should um, speak at Harvard about what you're doing there. And it was, um, uh, and the Harvard started using the Monash Mindfulness Program in their elective um, student wellbeing programs, uh, which was sort of a little like taking coal to Newcastle, taking mindfulness to, to Boston. But um, that was interesting because when it was sort of referred to in the New England Journal of Medicine article about um, medical student depression and that Harvard was using the program, all of a sudden a few people in Monash sort of started to take it a little bit seriously and thought, oh, oh okay, well, you know, there might be something in it. But um, uh, there were increasing invitations throughout Monash, a growing interest, and of course, um, uh, there was a lot happening around the world at this stage, the research base starting to go up. 
Um, support from health, wellbeing and development as it was at the time, starting to run train-the-trainer programs that people from staff all around the university could, could uh, avail themselves of. Um, uh, and then over the following few years, uh, mindfulness for academic success, mindfulness at work, and Richard, Richard was developing some programs there. OH&S were widely promoting mindfulness to help with um, staff well-being. Um, other faculties, but it was like this sort of developing critical of ma uh, critical mass, and uh, because it was being taught that other people could sort of relate to, um, there was a I suppose a, a strong support of it in the in the wider university, and other faculties around 2010 um, physiotherapy integrated mindfulness program again as core curriculum like the medical students um, program, and then uh, it's it's grown since there. So um, it's now. Um, uh, part of the academic heads training. All new academic heads at Monash have a mindfulness uh, workshop as a part of their induction program. Um, a letter to the Vice Chancellor in um, 2011, when uh, um, it had been, you know, the, the concerns about staff well-being were such, um, that, and human resources were such that saying we need to be providing more support for um, for staff, and so. Uh, a letter was written to the Vice Chancellor at that time saying, well, we're running these kinds of programs. Is there interest in doing more in this space? And um, so the Vice Chancellor instigated um, uh, Mental Health at Monash um, and who uh, started to say, right, we want widespread mindfulness programs for staff available. And there was specific funding two days a week to just purely do mindfulness training. So two days a week now I'm seconded from the Department of General Practice to do mindfulness training. And the following year, um, Richard um, was brought on board as a second mindfulness consultant two days a week to work particularly with students. I was working with staff and students, and particularly um, Richard was developing programs for students. And there's research activities going on as well. But it's a part of the Monash Mental Health Strategy, so it's integrated right at grassroots. Um, so, a lot of um, useful things happening. Um, I won't go into this um, too much. Is this a... Um, but uh, whoops. Uh, the, uh, the mindfulness components are really integrated at various levels. Um, obviously for emergency responses and so on, you want a mindful uh, person responding to the emergency, but um, as um, mental health promotion programs and resilience, early intervention, so all the counselling staff at Monash use mindfulness as a part of their, because they've all done the train the trainer programs and so on. And, um, so there's various levels at which the mindfulness has been particularly integrated. Um, the programs, these are some of the programs and I'm going to go over briefly and Richard's going to go over some uh, shortly as well. And we've been collaborating with a range of other universities, ANU and Deakin, Notre Dame, Harvard, Auckland, Montreal, McGill, in terms of just sharing experience. So I think it's great to sort of cross boundaries and everybody to cross pollinate in a way. Um, so some of the programs, I'll just say a little bit about what, what's happening in the medical curriculum. A case for it to be integrated as core curriculum, a case needs to be made to the faculty and in this case also to the, um, uh, to the people that sort of mandate medical courses around Australia, so the Australian Medical Council. Um, firstly, student wellbeing. I, it makes no sense, for example, in medicine that you could come out of a medical course with worse mental and physical health than when you went into it. Done five or six years of training in health and come out with worse health than at the start. If health and well-being is not a core objective of uh, professional development and training, then it just doesn't make any sense. Building resilience and preventing care of burnouts. Care of burnouts is very important for somebody who's in the caring profession, but uh, also building resilience. And of course, in law, psychology, teaching and so on, resilience and being able to manage the demands that go with professional life, again, should be a core element of, um, and I think the case can be easily made. Enhancing clinical performance, empathy and communication. Um, so how is mindfulness going to help with that? Because these are core um, clinical skills. Integrating biomedical, psychological and social sciences with clinical medicine. Because if it's seen as this sort of peripheral, warm, fuzzy kind of bit on the, on the side of the curriculum, and here's the serious scientific curriculum, then the students marginalise it in their thinking. It has to actually be integrated with all of these other core elements of the curriculum, particularly the scientific elements. You know, when speaking to the law, for example, <coughs> legal groups and so on, the science really talks, the evidence really talks, and I don't think we want to shy away from that. As in, I, I guess the, the, the science is a little bit like, and the information is a little bit like a lecture on hydration. 
if that's where it stops, then that's not really educating about mindfulness. The, the experience of it is the drinking of the water. Electron hydration without the experience of drinking water is very dry, but the, the background information gets a person at least to start picking up the glass and, and being interested to engage with the practice and the experience of it. But that's a very important key in the door, I think. Laying the foundation for clinical skills and lifestyle management, behavior change, stress management, peer support, the tutorial groups work like a uh, support group, um, that's the way we teach it. Experiential and deep learning, it's not just the theory, it's got to be integrated with experience and how it applies in their day-to-day -day life. And patients are often going to complementary practitioners, of course, because they're not getting this kind of information and support from their doctors. And so there's a whole range of cases that were made for integrating it in the curriculum. OK, now just to give you a bit of a sense of some of the kind of information to support that, uh, this was a study of New South Wales interns. At eight months in their first year of working life, 75% of New South Wales interns would qualify as having burnout using Maslach's burnout inventory, and 73% would have qualified as having had a mental illness. Clinical depression or an anxiety disorder were the two big ones. I don't know if you're aware of that. Three quarters would have had a, a diagnosable mental illness on at least one occasion just in the first year of their working life. This is a sad indictment on the way that we train a professional to do a job. We think it's just about the technical skills and the knowledge. We don't think it's about a human being stepping into a demanding environment, learning to meet those kinds of demands. Has to, the case has to be supported by what's the data say, and that's pretty sobering data. Um, the backgrounds, and again, I won't, I won't labour the point, but there's so many studies. Nearly all of the research, and there are thousands of studies, say that there's poor mental health, high levels of stress, it affects clinical functioning and so on. Hardly any studies look at, well, what's the solution for the problem? There's hardly any research on that. Um, few integrated um, programs in terms of curriculum. There's um, most of the MBSR studies were on elective programs. So there's hard, well, I think we're the first to have a uh, core curriculum, not as an elective. Um, uh, around the world. So I told you guys to slow down and take it easy or something like this would happen. So just in terms of um, making the case that uh, attention and performance is very important, this is a British Medical Journal study. 20% of resident medical staff would qualify as having clinical depression at any given point in time. A depressed doctor makes more than six times as many medication and prescribing errors as a non-depressed doctor doing the same job. Right? If you ever wind up in hospital as a patient and a doctor walks up to the bedside, the very first thing you do is a mental state examination on the doctor, right? Because they're stressed, anxious, and depressed. You give them empathy and counselling and you teach them meditation skills, but do not let them treat you under any circumstances. If the attention's not on the job, what is the attention on? Depressive rumination, negative self-talk, self-criticism, and all the rest. This is very important that we say, well, wait a sec, this is not just about self-care. Caring for oneself is not selfish, it's an investment in the well-being of the people that one is trying to look after. Not just for doctors, for anybody who's, who's in a profession where trying to care for others. So wait a minute here, Mr. Crumbly. Maybe it isn't kidney stones after all. <laughs> now this is a doctor who's trained in mindfulness who can pick up a lot of very subtle clinical signs that other doctors would clearly miss. So um, there's a whole literature now on clinical mindfulness, patient safety. What are, what's the effect of being unmindful on these um, being uh, subject to bias. So two main kinds of bias are confirmation bias. For example, a doctor steps into a situation already with an assumption they don't even know they've got and then interprets everything they see to fit in with the assumption that they've already made. If you train a doctor to be more mindful and the doctor steps into a situation, oh, it's just this. Oh, wait a sec, I'm just making an assumption. I haven't actually looked at the patient yet. There's a capacity to self-correct. So again, these are linking mindfulness and attention, which is, I suppose, a broader issue, you know, the broader issue of attention and awareness, to link it with actually high-level clinical skills. So that rationale, those dots have to be joined. Um, the Health Enhancement Program is where the mindfulness comes up, and I'll just say a couple of words about this. It's an experiential um, program that works in, in small groups, so the, the tutorial operates like a support group. Students are encouraged to share experiences and so on, have a um, high level of participation, invite inquiry and healthy scepticism when they step into the program. Um, the core content is examinable, and if you're wanting to integrate curriculum like this into core curriculum, then if it's not accessible, the students won't take it seriously and they'll hardly turn up at all. If it's core curriculum, 
if for no other reason, they'll take it seriously because, well, I'm going to step into an exam room and I'm going to have to explain mindfulness to a role-playing patient, or I'm going to see it on written exams about uh, the clinical applications or contraindications to mindfulness, etc. Um, the personal participation or application of the practical activities is encouraged, but it's voluntary. It's at the end of the day when the students step out of the tutorial room, it's up to them what they do in their personal life, whether they practice it or not. I think it's very important that it's not students don't perceive that it's being imposed on them, which I think can actually just amplify resistance, but the students are taught about it and then invited to apply and practice it and come back each week and share, well, what are you noticing? What are you discovering? What are you seeing going on? And uh, so, but it's up to the students at the end of the day. And integrated with other curriculum, their cases, the health promotion and so on. So it's linked at various um, other points. Oops, not sure what's going on. Okay, the assessment, formative assessment, so they keep a weekly reflective journal about their experience, um, tutorial feedback each week, uh, summative assessment on the various exams, and uh, lectures, 10 uh, lectures that underpin not just the mindfulness bit, but a whole range of other lifestyle aspects, but uh, two of them are on mind, body, and mindfulness, and the tutorials, we have six two-hour tutorials. Half of that, one hour of those tutorials each week is mindfulness, and the other hours on other various aspects of lifestyle. Um, Self-directed learning, apply the practices, keep the journals. Uh, the program is integrated within the ESSENCE model, so the Health Enhancement Program is based on this model. ESSENCE is an acronym standing for Education, Stress Management, so that's the Mindfulness and Mind-Body Area, Spirituality, Exercise, Nutrition, Connectedness and Environment. So the mindfulness underpins the ability to learn about all the other lifestyle elements and, and promote a healthy lifestyle as well. That's the cover of the book, The Essence of Health. Can't teach a medical student anything unless it's based on an acronym, right? So, um, <laughs> um, the program, the Stress Release Program, which was the one that was written in 1991, um, and we don't ask the students to do 40 minutes of practice, because if we did, I think there'd be a mass rebellion. Um, now, although I practice half an hour twice a day, we only say to the students, all right, if you want to learn to punctuate your day with moments of stillness and stopping and paying attention, then you might want to punctuate it with some full stops, say two five-minute practices, say before and after you, you, you know, at the start and at the end of your day at university, for example, but lots of little commas throughout the day. So that could just be 15, 30, 60 seconds. So little, little commas just to put a bit of space between the completion of one activity and the commencement of another. The day-to-day -day informal practice, so learning to be mindful, paying attention when you're sitting down trying to study, because the students need to understand that the mindfulness practice needs to follow them out of the chair. There's no point in being mindful for five or 10 minutes in the chair and then being unmindful for the other 23 hours and 50 minutes in the day. The aim is the informal practice of mindfulness to be aware in the day-to-day -day life. The cognitive strategies that are integral um, to it, perception, letting go, acceptance, presence of mind, for example, these are, are supposed to be four. So they explore all of those as well. What's the effect, particularly stressed, anxious and depressed, where's the mind then? Is it living a future that hasn't even happened? Is it reliving a past that's already come and gone? So to start to learn a bit about that. Um, I won't say too much about the study that we did. Um, Steve Delisle uh, was doing an honours year and he said he wanted to come and um, uh, do a study with the, um, uh, the medical students and um, under the supervision of uh, Gavin Sullivan. And um, so we um, did a study with our students that we published in 2009. Um, what we found was by the end of the program, 90% of the medical students said, I'm applying mindfulness in my own day-to-day -day life. Now this is 320 students who go through the program every year, um, plus another 200 off other campuses who do the program. So 90% of them saying, I'm applying mindfulness in my day-to-day -day life, we were actually quite surprised that that was the uptake. We also measured their mental health and well-being prior to the program in a low-stress period of semester, and then after the program in a, in a um, high-stress period, immediately prior to mid-year exams, when we should have seen declines in mental health and, um, and uh, quality of life. Um, oh, sorry. I'll, uh, what we actually found was that everything we measured about their mental health and well-being, even in the high-stress period, had significantly improved. It wasn't that they didn't get worse in the exam period. Everything we measured about their mental health and well-being significantly improved. The DAS, the WHO call, the symptom checklist 90. It's very useful to have some evidence or data on what you're doing. That um, if it is useful, then that needs to be seen to be done as well. So to actually do some research if you're providing programs that actually have some data helps enormously. 
Um, another study under the supervision, uh, Jen Opie under the supervision of Richard, and I was supporting the program as well, and David Clark. Um, is again looking at our medical students last year, and there was uh, the students increasing the level of mindfulness, but the relationship between mindfulness and study engagement, so an adaptation of the work engagement scales, and uh, the students, as they become more mindful, they become more study engaged. So some of the important principles um, in terms of integrating it into curriculum, I would say, make the case to the students as well as the faculty. They need to have a reason, a rationale that makes sense to them within their context as to why this is a valuable skill. And it needs to be in that language. If it's in a, uh, a philosophical language that is foreign to them, it won't make sense. It needs to uh, make the case to the students in ways that are important and relevant for them. For some, it's stress management. For others, it's focus and decision making and learning. Voluntary personal application, if it's in core curriculum, you need to, I think, respect that. Make the core knowledge and skills accessible. Um, tutor selection, if you're going to have people training in this area, then um, choose the tutors very carefully. Um, they need to have a personal and a professional commitment. Somebody being dragged out of a lab saying, you've got to go and teach this curriculum because we've got nobody else to do it, your, your curriculum will die in no time at all because you've got somebody who's sitting up there embodying possibly the opposite of what you're wanting them to embody. That's not a good advice. Um, obviously train and debrief and so on. Underpinned by a lecture series, so the science and the clinical applications, integrated with other content, so it's not seen to be separate to, to the other content. And use the language and delivery carefully. I'm acquainted with Buddhist, Vedic philosophies, Plato, look, just, I love it. But if I stand up there and I talk a foreign language, I do not present it as a Buddhist thing, or as a Vedic thing. Um, because that's not the language, it's not familiar. And it would marginalise it in the students' minds. Um, it's a universal thing, it's a human thing. And um, which is not to deny the tremendously valuable contribution that, say, the Buddhist tradition and other great philosophical traditions have made to mindfulness and many practitioners. But I think in that kind of context is to use the language. I mean, I could teach a whole mindfulness course, nothing but just quoting Shakespeare, for example, choosing something from that culture, that cultural context that um, is congruent for the, the students' groups. So let's this again. Okay, um, the other programs, physios, dietetic students, occupational <coughs> therapy, nursing, pharmacy, uh, this year integrating a program. So this is being integrated across the faculty into uh, at varying levels right across um, all these different disciplines. Now, I'm going to hand over to Richard, who's going to say a little bit about some of the uh, programs like Mindfulness for Academic Success. So this is another approach, not as core curriculum. And then we review what's helped it to get a practice going, what some of the obstacles that get in the way are. You know, everything's a learning opportunity in a mindfulness program. If you, if you take off the label of good and bad, right and wrong, and actually look at things on face value, you can learn a lot about, and, and people, you can teach people a lot about what's actually getting in the way to what are some of those obstacles. There are different meditation practices, some of these will be familiar to you. Body scan, body and breath meditation, thought labelling, mindful listening, mindful eating. So you'll see these are all ways of really sort of bringing it into the, into the students' lives in a really sort of broad way. But then what we do here as well that's quite unique in some ways is we specifically teach the students how to apply the the mindfulness to their academic and, and social lives, right? So rather than just teaching the meditation and assuming that they're going to figure out how to sort of make the link, we actually teach them how to do it, to be more present, to reduce stress, to improve their focus, to learn about habits like procrastination, to actually shed some light on that so they can start to change it, and of course to communicate more effectively. <clears throat> so the MASS program looks like this. You know, the first session's in a, a sort of a general introduction where we talk about mindfulness, we talk about unmindfulness, um, and we have a conversation about it basically, and then we teach the body scan and um, have a conversation about how they can start to practice that. Then in the second session we focus more explicitly on stress, stress reduction. In the third session, learning to focus, so session four is procrastination, and then we have a general review in the final session. Um, and this is a, an example of the kind of thing that we do, you know, we'll, um, we'll get the students to get into pairs. So this deals with so-called multitasking, right? I mean, 
it's actually, the research shows that it's not possible. Right? I'm sure some of you know that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet, despite knowing that, we tend to try to keep focusing on more than one thing at a time, right? Turns out the brain's not wired that way. We can't actually focus on more than one complex thing at a time. Our attention switches backwards and forwards. You're driving in your car, you're on the phone, even if you're on the hands-free. Your attention's going to the road, back to the phone, back to the road. And it goes backwards and forwards, and we can switch our attention so fast that it seems like we're doing more than one thing at a time, but actually we're not, where attention switches. And so we do exercises to sort of show the effects of that. So we get them to break into pairs. One of the people talks about something that they're interested in or passionate about, and the job of the other person, the listener, is to listen to what's being said, but at the same time to send a text message or get on Facebook or Instagram, right? And what they learn pretty quickly is that they can't actually do a very good job of that, right? I mean, they find that they're actually missing most of the conversation, they're sending ridiculous texts, or they're forgetting what they're doing. And it just sheds light on something that's already happening in the background. This is how most young people, and probably a lot of us as well, actually function these days, in this distracted kind of way, with the phones out, and we're trying to do more than one thing at a time. And so these, this course just sheds light on that. And I noticed this phenomenon called the attentional blink. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's basically the fact that every time we switch our attention from one thing to another, the attentional systems of the brain, they go offline for a very short period of time, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 of a second. But long enough that if you switch your attention constantly backwards and forwards from, you know, if you're studying and you've got multiple tabs open, you're going across to sort of Facebook and Twitter and checking email, and the phone's going off and it's music, you're wasting half a second, half a second, half a second each time, and it seriously starts to add up. And so they have this experience of that, they really notice the effect of doing that. And often that's enough, you know, we don't need to sort of preach to them or, or, or sort of be prescriptive, but just sometimes shedding light on some of these things makes a really big difference. So this, this is the attention as we were talking about. And the research actually shows that it takes, that we lose between 0.2 to 0.5 of a second every time we switch our attention. And that becomes pretty obvious when they're trying to track a conversation at the same time as checking their phone. Research also shows, and you might know this from your own experience, that when we stop and check an email, it takes over a minute to get our attention fully back to what we were doing before. You probably know that from your working lives, you know, where you're sort of working on something, an email comes in, you check it, you get back and you're like, what was I doing again? And if you do that every five minutes in a 40 hour working week, you actually waste eight and a half hours where you're not paying attention to anything at all. And so sometimes just presenting the evidence like this, linking it in with their experience, is pretty effective. Um, and I usually say, well, just in case you don't believe me, here's a really simple experiment. And our, our programs include a lot of experiments like this. Just say to yourself silently in your head the letters A to Z as fast as you can. I'm going to guess most of you are done already. So you just do the numbers 1 to 26. And now I'm going to very simply ask you to switch between letters and numbers. So A1, B2, C3, up to Z26. <laughs> and so see, straight away, you usually, you usually <laughs> have to evoke some giggles, right? Because straight away you're going to notice the really obvious slowing down. And did anyone lose track after about E5 or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And this, so this is the attentional blink, and this is happening all the time, right? Constantly, but we just don't tend to notice it. So you start to shed some light on these things using us, and then the way students study just starts to spontaneously change. And you know, letters and numbers, I mean, come on, that's some pretty simple attention switching, right? Um, you know, the evidence shows that if you're talking on the phone while driving a car, you're four times more likely to have a crash, that's why it's illegal. It's the same as being 0.08 in driving simulators. <coughs> and, the, and some really recent research shows that if you're texting or on the internet on, your, on a smartphone while driving, you're 164 times more likely to have a crash, right? So just sometimes presenting this information is pretty helpful. So as, with that as a background, this is session three I'm talking about in the maths program where we're really teaching students to focus on one thing at a time rather than trying to study or operate in this really sort of distracted, scattered way. We teach them thought labeling meditation. So if anyone that doesn't know what that is, it's, it's a meditation where the primary focus is on the breath, and any time you catch the attention wandering, you just gently label it silently in your head, thinking, thinking, just to, just to acknowledge that. 
So focus on the breath, you notice your attention is wandered. And just say thinking, thinking. That helps to draw a line in the sand so you notice more clearly when the attention is wandered. We also emphasize being gentle. You know? um, how often are we sort of tough on ourselves, self-critical, and when people start learning mindfulness and practicing meditation, so often the attention wanders, like, oh, come on, get back, and that, that second layer of frustration or self-criticism kicks in. And so we teach students that there's an alternative to that, just to notice the attention is wandered and just gently bring it back. And a lot of them, particularly international students, tend to have these epiphanies. I think that for some reason, international students, particularly from Asian countries, seem to be very tough on themselves. It just seems to be how they're wired. And one of the things that they learn doing these programs is that they can be more focused and more present and more productive, but at the same time gentler on themselves, just by noticing their attention is wandered and bringing it back without that habitual judgment. So we teach thought labeling. And that becomes a practice for the week, you know, a meditation practice, five or ten minutes of thought labeling meditation, um, just to notice. And what this does is it engages the prefrontal cortex. You know? The mind wanders off, the, uh, the default circuits of the brain become active, the limbic system becomes active as emotions get evoked. And the moment, first of all, the moment we realize and bring our attention back, that engages the prefrontal cortex. But so does non judgmentally labeling the thinking or the abstraction. Um, it just makes it easier to return to the present. So that's the meditation that we teach in the session. And then we extend that and we do a work meditation. So we, <coughs> we hand out either a Sudoku or sometimes a reading comprehension task. Craig right? gets people to memorize Shakespearean sonnets. Um, <laughs> there are a limited number of tasks that you can hand out. This becomes the meditation, so to speak. And this is where we really teach them to link mindfulness meditation with their study. So you'll notice there are two columns, right? On this side, there's a task, and on this side, there's a blank column. And so the instruction here is that they get 10 minutes to do the Sudoku, and this is the primary focus of their attention. And of course, if they're thinking, you know, is that a three, you know, it can't be a three, is that you consider that to be thinking about the task, but then if their mind invariably wanders into, this is really hard, I wish I had the, um, the spot the difference, or like, I really suck at Sudokus, or I wonder how that person's going. The instructions just to notice that and to label that, or even just to put a little check mark. So they start to put a little check mark. So they just notice when their attention is wanted, acknowledge that, bring their attention back to the job. And you know, usually after 10 minutes, there's, there's, a, there's a page full of check marks. And sometimes there are recurrent thoughts, particular things that people get caught up in. And if they notice that type of thought, they can just write it down and then bring their attention back to the task. So it just teaches them to catch it and bring their attention back. And then we extend that even further and send them off into their lives. And the instruction for the week is just to have a pad nearby when they're studying. So when they're actually working on their assignment, if they notice their attention wander off, little check mark, bring their attention back to the work. And of course, you've probably discovered as well that sometimes when you're trying to focus on one thing, that's the time that your mind just wants to remember the unpaid bills or the things that you've got to do. So just having an opportunity to write that down means they can let it go rather than trying to sort of store it somewhere. I don't want to forget about the bill, but I really want to focus on the work. Let it go, attention back to the work. And when we debrief that in the, in, the, in the subsequent session, what we find is that they just spend more time focused on what they need to be doing, less time in the what ifs, more time with the what is. So that's, that's an example of how we do this kind of stuff. Um, in session four, we teach we have a conversation about procrastination. First of all, framing it as a habit, right? It's not a genetic defect or a disease. It's just a, it's a habit that we form over time. And in fact, 70% of university students would self-identify as procrastinators, and maybe the other 30% haven't got around to acknowledging that. 20% yeah. <laughs> would say it's chronic, you know? It's ongoing, long-standing, and causing significant problems for them. But again, <coughs> inquiry, mindful inquiry, taking off labels of good and bad, being willing to see things on their merits, face value, as they are, we can have a conversation about this. So we actually have a brainstorm about what are some of the obstacles when you set out to do, you know, in, recently when you set out to do some work and you haven't done it, what is it that's got in the way? You know, what, and there are some predictable things, but we get a long list of things. You know, what are some of the things that get in the way for you? And then, of course, on the other side of the fence, on the other side of the whiteboard, you could say, what are some of the strategies? What are some of the things that actually help you to get started? So straight away, the students are hearing from others 
that they're not alone, you know, in, in their procrastination, that there are very predictable kind of ways that we do it. And there are strategies that some students use that others think, oh, maybe I'll try that, right? That could work really well. And then we teach them how to use mindfulness to actually overcome this habit of procrastination. And so what we do is, first of all, we get them to fill in a weekly planner. And I'm always shocked how few students use these, right? They somehow just try to keep it in their head, you know, I've got two hours to write that assignment on Tuesday. I mean, it's pretty simple. We, we coach them in how to use this. You fill in the non-negotiable stuff, the sleep time, the travel time, the lectures, the fixed shifts of work, that kind of thing. Then you fill in the semi-negotiable stuff, the, the, the drive to the gym, the gym session, whatever it is that you do recreationally, right? And, and so then, once all that's locked in, what you notice is heaps of white space. There are these big blocks of time that students often don't even realise they have. I mean, this is pretty, it's not rocket science, pretty basic stuff, right? And then we say, okay, so for each of these blocks, each of these study blocks that you can see, how about you treat it like a mindfulness meditation? So for each of the blocks, let's say from 12 to 2 on a Tuesday, that's a block of time that you've committed to studying. Sit down at your desk with your computer open or your books open, and the intention is to start studying. So you're focused on what's going on. You've got a pad nearby. Every time your attention wanders off, you just make a little check mark. Or if you remember something you've got to do, you write it down. Or if you need to do something on Facebook, you write it down for later, and that can be your reward afterwards. And the intention is to get started. You bring the attention back. And usually what happens is they get going, just with a simple task, get that momentum, and then it's pretty easy to keep going. And after five minutes, the instruction is, if they want to, and they're already studying, they can keep studying. Or if they decide, not going to do it, not interested, shut the books, shut the laptop, go and do something else, but do it consciously. Don't do it on automatic pilot, which is, of course, what tends to happen with procrastination. They just suddenly find themselves on Facebook, and, oh, it's been three hours already, right? Actually make these choices a bit more consciously. This is, kind of, this is how we do it. So that's an example of, of, of one of the programs. So really, the, point, the, the main point there is that we teach meditation, but then we coach them how to actually apply it to address different challenges that they might face. And then we've got these embedded programs. So Craig's talked at length about uh, what's happening in medicine and health science and allied health generally. But more recently, so I was sort of doing this stuff with the elective programs at the same time that Craig, as I said, was putting the finishing touches on medicine. And then because of these higher level talks and because of some of the interest of just synchronicity and, and sort of perfect storms, the university got really interested in mindfulness in a much more general sense. Because, I mean, less stressed and better grades, it's a no-brainer, right, in education, I mean, of course. And so there were, people started having conversations about, hang on, so why is it just in medicine? Maybe this could be more broadly across the university. And that's, I mean, that's what we're doing now. So one of the, you know, it's now in, pharmacy, physiotherapy, but one of the things that's happened recently actually is the business faculty has become very interested in mindfulness. Um, so there are a couple of things that we're doing where we're working with the Bachelor of Business and also with the MBA and Executive MBA programs. And the Bachelor of Business is a, a three-year degree and in the final year they've got this capstone series where it's really sort of just putting the finishing touches on the entire degree and it's sort of bringing in industry professionals, um, sort of inspiring the students, getting them to think beyond the course, but also drawing together a lot of the learning and really sort of helping them sort of focus and consolidate that. So we've got two one-hour lectures, which we're going to provide, which introduces mindfulness generally, and then in the second lecture, extends that and talks about how mindfulness is applicable in a business setting, you know, what's the evidence for and what are some of the ways it can help. Um, and the students, it's really, it's, it's quite an interesting way that we're doing this actually. The students are given this two-hour workshop. They get, these, they get these different sort of seminars. And in one of them, they, they get, in two of them I should say, they get given this sort of, this critical incident. You know, the Aussie dollar sheds 10% and your business goes into a tailspin. What do you do? What do you do? Kind of thing. Or your factory collapses and some workers get killed. You know, how are you going to address that? What are you going to do? Just to get them to think creatively and critically. And so we're going to actually encourage them to deal with the first one reactively. In fact, we're just going to let them do it. I mean, of course, that's what they're going to do, isn't it? They're going to sit down, they're going to panic, oh, what do I do, what do I do? And then we're going to teach them mindfulness and how to use it to get centred and present. 
um, to slow things down, to make better decisions, to have some more discernment, to see things more clearly. Then we're going to present them with the second of these sort of cataclysmic events and coach them through using mindfulness to actually deal with it more effectively and then have a session where we'll review it afterwards. What's the difference between making decisions, between being a business leader when you do it reactively without any awareness compared to when you actually do it with some awareness? So it's just a really good way to link this in to their learning, to link this into their study. Uh, in the MBA, we were, we were approached last year to develop uh, the MBA is being sort of redesigned, and we were both approached to consult on how mindfulness can be implemented in a really sort of structured way over the two years of the MBA. Um, and so we've got a t we've both given a two-hour lecture on mindfulness, and it's it's um, the evidence for it in, um, in business. And we've got these five or six-hour um, workshops that we're doing over the next two years. Um, dealing with things like stress, obviously. I mean, this is this is what we do, as Craig said, you know, we sat down with the um, director of the MBA and we, and we asked, you know, what are the what are the key criteria, what are the things that you need that your business lead and leaders need help with? And of course it's stress reduction, it's communication, it's decision making, you know, it's change management, it's, it's these kinds of things. So we've we've actually developed sessions that directly address each of these. That makes it immediately relevant for them. And this is again an example of something that we might do. So, you know, we might randomly assign tasks to the students, a little bit like what we did before uh, in the maths program. So, just give them Sudoku, maths problem, some kind of word problem, get them to memorise something, um, and then debrief their experience. So, first of all, you know, what were their initial reactions to being given a task that they maybe weren't particularly happy about? and have a conversation about mindsets, you know. What was their approach to this? Did they have a fixed mindset about how they were going to do it? Or was it a growth mindset? And what was the difference between the two? And also, what was the effect of, of their reaction to their performance, to attention, to engagement, to enjoyment, that kind of thing? And then, and then we'll get them to repeat it, and just to notice, become more conscious of their mindsets, more conscious of their reactions. Um, and then just have a general discussion about how mindfulness can help them with their study, but also with their business. All right, so I'm probably going to hand back to you at this point, yeah. just to yeah. talk about how we go about communicating the message to really get people on the way. What I'll do um, at this point is just to give what might be the introductory few minutes of a a lecture and introductory session to medical students, to MBA and so on. So, so um, I, I feel that uh, very often uh, an introductory lecture or presentation is helpful in getting people into the space to be thinking about moving into the practice, which is where, of course, the real learning starts to take place. So I'll just give you a bit of a sense of the kind of language that, you know, say, myself and, and Richard, we've all got our own way of expressing things, but just to give a bit of a sense. All right, now I'm going to put uh, to you a, uh, a question, a multiple choice question. Now this is based on a study that was <coughs> done at Harvard University and published in the journal Science. The study was set up to look at the relationship between where a person's attention was moment by moment in their day and how happy they were. So the way they devised to do that was to give people iPhones. And the participants of the study got the iPhone and then they would be called at random times during the day. And the call would come in and three questions would be put to them. At the very moment the call came in, rate your happiness from 1 to 100. Secondly, what were you doing at the moment the call came in? And then they answered that question. Thirdly, at the moment the call came in, where was your attention? And people had four options they could choose as to where their attention was. So the question for you is, which of the followings associated with the greatest self-reported happiness? Was it A? the mind wandering to unpleasant topics, B, the mind wandering to neutral topics, C, the mind wandering to pleasant topics, or D, the mind not, uh, sorry, um, paying attention to what you're currently doing. Now I'm going to ask you to vote for whichever one you choose. So put up your hand if you vote for A. Anybody here vote for A? Anybody vote for B? Anybody vote for C? Anybody want to vote for C other than I'm giving a talk on mindfulness? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody vote for D? <coughs> okay, well the correct answer is actually D. People are happiest when they're paying attention to what they're doing in the present moment. Happier than when they were thinking about the pleasant trip they went on at Easter or anything else. 
Now that's counterintuitive because most people assume the answer is C. I'm happiest when I'm thinking about something pleasant from the past or something I'm anticipating in the future. Now this was the conclusion of the researchers in the study. In conclusion, a human mind is a wandering mind. And I'm just going to check here, how many people here have got a wandering mind? Anybody here got a mind? I do actually notice that there are a few hands that aren't up, and I'm just going to assume you're not even listening to what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> so I'm going to assume that we all have a wandering mind. And a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. The ability to think about what is not happening is a cognitive achievement, so like an achievement in thinking that comes at an emotional cost. What is it about the wandering mind? How does it affect how we feel? Uh, our vulnerability to stress? How does it affect how we function? How does it affect how we communicate, empathize? So it says here, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. So clearly there are quite a few dots that haven't been joined just yet. And I'm just going to try and join a few of those dots. As to the relationship between attention, mind, and body. So we get a sense of why it is that training attention or being present and attentive has the effects on the mind and the body that it does. So let's um, talk about the stress response for a moment. Drive, George, drive. This one's got a coat hanger. Now, I don't know if you can tell there. This guy looks like he's pretty good with a coat hanger. And I think he's going to be in the car in another few moments. So George is activating the stress response, which actually has a more descriptive name, which is the fight or flight response. And he probably needs to switch that on pretty quickly, I would say. So to fight or to fly. Now, what would you recognize going on in your body if you were switching on that response? Adrenaline, what would that be doing? Uh, heart beating, your gut's shutting down, certainly. Might get like cold hands and feet. Yep, so pale and um, the periphery and so on. Let, sorry, breathe. Well, yeah, you start to feel like you're short of breath, you want to breathe fast. Now let's consider what all these changes are about. If you're in a situation like this, this is an activation response. All right? You, it's like if it was a car going into a totally different gear, turbocharge, right? Why? Because there's going to be a big output of energy over the next few minutes while we try and get out of danger. So the circulation becomes hyperdynamic. Heart rate, blood pressure, cardiac contractility goes up. That means the heart beats are bigger than normal. So the heart's not just going fast, it's thumping. Where's all the extra blood going? Mostly to the muscles, because they're going to be doing the work over the next few minutes. So the blood vessels for the muscles open up. Now, if there's more blood going in one direction, it's got to come from somewhere else. So it's like resource allocation. Do you have resource allocation issues at the University of New South Wales? <laughs> we don't have them at Monash, of course, no. We do. But anyway, so the blood's diverted away from the skin, so we go pale and from the periphery. And also away from the gut, because digesting breakfast is not a very high priority while you're trying to get away from a line. So the whole gastrointestinal system shuts down. The, uh, there's a rapid release of sugars and fats into your bloodstream. This is the fuel to burn. To burn the fuel, we need oxygen on board and we've got to breathe off carbon dioxide. So the respiratory drive in the brain kicks in, making us want to breathe fast. And metabolic rate goes up. That makes us, um, to help us to burn the fuel faster than normal. So we start to feel hot and we're starting to sweat to keep ourselves cool while we're exerting ourselves. Our blood gets thick and sticky and will clot faster than normal. So you've heard of the term blood curdling? Well, it is actually literally blood curdling because the capacity to stop bleeding fast could be the difference between life and death in a few moments from now. Um, and from an attention point of view, the attention centres, the proprioceptive centres in the brain are really lit up because it needs to see where the threat is, where the escape route is. So it's a very alert, present moment orientated state of mind. He's not thinking about, oh, should I top up the super next year or anything like that? He's not thinking about that at all. Are all of these changes happening in this situation meant to be good or bad for his health? Good, good. Good. This is nature's way of trying to save our life. Um, there's nothing, not a single change about this, cortisol, adrenaline, anything that is actually meant to be bad for us. Now, you've probably heard a lot of stuff about inverted commas stress is meant to be bad for our health, and I've just said actually it's meant to be good for us. So maybe there are times we switch this response on when we don't really need it. Has anybody here ever gotten anxious before an event? <laughs> what kinds of events? <laughs> Running a, a symposium? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Interview, exams, students. We often get stressed and anxious before events, not just minutes, but sometimes days, weeks, months, or even years. What about over things in the past? Anybody here ever gotten stressed over something in the past? Yeah. Angry over something that happened last week or last year? Now, in this situation, we point to this line, we say, there's the stressor, there it is. Um, but in these other situations, before or after an event has even happened, where is the stressor? Where is it? 
in the mind. It's in the mind. Imagine, the mind is imagining and projecting and catastrophizing and worrying and anticipating and ruminating and reliving. And there may be no actual present moment threat or stressor. But if we are not mindful, it is very easy to take an imaginary threat to be real. And the body will not dis distinguish between which is which. If the body is told to by the mind, it will just switch on the stress response. And there we are, it's 3 a.m. in the morning. All that life is throwing at us at that moment is a warm doona and a soft pillow. That's all that's actually happening in reality. But in our mind, we could be in a world of pain, catastrophizing about a thousand things. As Mark Twain said, I've had a lot of catastrophes in my life, and some of them actually happened. <laughs> so, and if we are not mindful, we leave ourselves incredibly vulnerable to that. And in that situation, that is not experienced as an activation response, that's experienced as anxiety, because the chemicals are pumping out, but they've got nowhere to go and they've got nothing to do. Now, just to give you a bit of a sense of some of the effects of this, allostatic load, a high level of physiological wear and tear that we place on our system, impaired immunity, university students, exam times, exposed to a virus, twice as likely to come down with a clinical infection as exposed to the same virus in a low stress period of semester, for example. Accelerated atherosclerosis, metabolic syndrome, blood glucose, blood lipids, blood pressure, etc. Bone demineralization, otherwise known as osteoporosis, and atrophy. These stress chemicals are neurotoxic. You lose brain cells. The gray matter thins. The brain, the adult brain, ages at a rapid rate. Particular areas that are targeted: the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, which are very important areas of the brain for learning, decision making, working in complex environments. Only one bit of the brain grows, which is called the amygdala. It's a fear stress center of the brain. We need the amygdala to fire off when we're trying to get away from a, a, a line. We don't need it firing off when we're trying to prepare for an exam or walk into an exam room. That does not help because it hijacks these higher uh, centers of the brain. So the more it's activated, the bigger it gets. We wire the brain for more stress all right, until it becomes so habituated. Now, this is the depressing news. How many people are stressed, anxious, and depressed by this stage of the presentation? <laughs> no? So you need some good news. <laughs> which is that all of these are reversible effects, even the ones in the brain, if we learn to recognize the inappropriate activation of this response. Right? If we do that, then everything will start to go back to normal. One of the first times I noticed this was worrying about future sporting, you know, when I used to do a lot of competitive swimming. And weeks prior to a big swimming meet, I'd be nervous and anxious. And I realized one time when I was sitting at home in a very comfortable chair, that there was an imaginary me standing on the imaginary starting box at the old Olympic pool in Melbourne waiting for an imaginary gun to go off three weeks from now. And I realised, wait a sec, there's a gum tree and bottle birds and dappled sunlight coming in through the French doors and so on. I'm in a dream world most of my life, I suspect, and I don't even realise it. It was one of my, as a 15-year-old, one of my first real mindful moments when I realised I'm totally not present. And I'm creating all this grief for myself. Anyway, the effect goes right down to the DNA. Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2009, Australian woman for discovering telomeres. I won't say too much about it, but the, the little caps on the end of our telomeres, uh, on, on the end of our chromosomes, are a little bit like the plastic bits on the end of your shoelace that stop your DNA from unraveling. The shorter the telomeres, the older we are as far as our DNA is concerned and the risk of chronic illness. So this is just one study among many of Elizabeth Blackburn and her team, but I want you to understand how deep the mind-body relationship goes. Premenopausal women who are carers for a child with a major chronic illness, big challenge in the day-to-day -day life. They looked at how well or poorly those women were coping with those demands, and a third were coping better than average, a third were coping average, and a third were coping less well than average. Those who were coping least well by their late 30s were 9 to 17 years older, as far as their DNA was concerned, compared to the women who were coping well. 9 to 17 years of accelerated ageing by your 30s is uh, quite a lot, I would have thought. Now, bedtime, Leroy, here comes your animal blanket. Now, I don't know if you can tell there, but Leroy <laughs> is clearly not travelling very well, and he's had his telomere length measured, and it's very short, all right? He hasn't got much left at all. Now, mind-wandering and ageing. Elizabeth Blackburn and her team. Low tendency for the mind to wander, longer than average telomeres. High tendency for the mind to wander, shorter than average telomeres. The more a person's mind tends to wander, the shorter the telomeres work. Why? Because when the mind's wandering, we're churning and worrying and anticipating, I've got so much to do today, will I meet the deadline, won't I? Every time you don't pay attention during this presentation, you take another five minutes off your life expectancy. <laughs> <laughs> Does that cut your attention? Okay. Now, why is there a lot of interest in mindfulness as well? Just very briefly, these are predictions by the year 2030 of what are expected to be the developed world's 10 top burdens of disease. 
Depression is expected to be way out in front uh, as the number one burden of disease, and heart disease, dementia, alcohol abuse, diabetes. Anything that has an effect of preventing depression or preventing the relapse of depression is very big news in healthcare. And uh, just park that at the back of your mind too, because the research on mindfulness and depression is probably more influential than anything else in creating a wider interest in mindfulness. So let's talk just very briefly about attention. Now, is this little fellow mindful, interested, present, mm -hmm. engaged? He looks pretty mindful to me anyway. I think the cat looks pretty mindful. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Neither the cat nor this little fellow have done any training in mindfulness at all, right? <laughs> just naturally in the moment kind of thing. Now, being mindful and being present is not a new skill we never had. It's the natural disposition of the human being. But from a relatively early age, we get into other habits. So learning mindfulness as an older child or as an adult is not learning a new skill. It is redeveloping a capacity that goes rusty very, very quickly if we're not using it. <clears throat> Attention deficit tray. This is a paper from the Harvard Business Review looking at the modern work environment which they described as hyperkinetic, time pressure, fast paced sort of work environment. And that kind of work environment was associated with what they call the tension deficit tray, the tendency in that environment to have a shorter and shorter attention span, to find it harder and harder to focus. We live in a world that doesn't make it easy to be mindful. And the attention deficit tray was associated with things like black and white thinking, difficulty staying organised, setting priorities, <coughs> managing time, and a constant low level of panic and guilt. And then we try and multitask, and Richard's already spoken about multitasking. And, um, any man who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. So, <coughs> Albert, <coughs> Albert Einstein advocated against it. So, this time I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't screw up. Roger screws up. So, Roger's clearly not paying attention to what he's doing. And um, so, and I gave you this example before. When we're not paying attention, stressed, anxious, we don't function well. Our attention's not on task. We feel bad, but we function poorly. And many people assume stress drives performance, it only drives it so far, and then performance crashes and burns. The highest level of performance is not a high stress state, it's a highly focused and engaged state. If you hear an athlete talking about being in the zone or a flow state, they do not describe stress or anxiety about the outcome. They just describe total engagement and flow in the moment with the process. High performance is a mindful state, not a stress state. Stress is better than apathy, but that's about as much as you can say for it. Um, default network. Um, so, I won't say too much about it. Enough has been said, but defaults the state of the mind and the brain that we go into when we're not paying attention. And the areas of the brain that are active in default mode are very different to the areas that are associated with paying attention. So, I'm going to um, just finish with this quote and just say a couple of words. Now, I'll cut the presentation there and just say a couple of words about um, communicating the message. So this is um, uh, Time Magazine, another major feature of mindfulness, and uh, what's become a very famous quote now from uh, the first major textbook in psychology. The faculty of voluntarily bringing back or wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character and will. No one is compassui or a master of themselves if you have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence become almost a prophetic kind of uh, quote these days. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of these uh, things, just there are lots of clinical applications. If we're having a longer presentation, I'll be giving examples of the research in these various areas. And uh, <clears throat> we shouldn't forget, of course, the world's great wisdom traditions were onto this thousands of years ago. These aren't new things, these are just new applications for very, very old skills. Most of the people I see in my professional life are interested in all the above. So I think it's important to engage there, to start there, but for many it matures, of course, into a much deeper uh, reflection. Okay, so as you travel life's highway, don't forget to stop and eat the roses. So just a little bit of cow philosophy. Um, so, and what we might do is just a, a few things about communicating the message, and then Richard and I, um, I think in the time we've got left until 20 past, there might be some questions and discussion and so on. Um, but communicating the message, start with the evidence. I think that really helps, particularly in an academic university environment. If it's not grounded on evidence, incredible science, explained in a way that makes sense, it is contextualised, I don't think it's a go up. Except for those who, that a small percentage, who are already interested in that space. But if you're presenting to a wider group, I think it's really important to start with. Um, it's got to be relevant to context. 
um, so relevant to the work or the profession being trained in uh, secular or academic environment. So, but uh, it's got to be. It's got to be contextualised, the generic skills given a particular emphasis, it's important for that group, for their particular needs. So address the recognised needs. I might have one agenda, I might be interested in inner peace and harmony, but a bunch of medical students aren't interested in that, they're introduced in how do I not kill my patient? Well, I reckon that's a pretty good place to, to start, for example, or how can I get better value out of my time studying? So what's their need? And then, and then relate to that, not what I think is important, not my agenda. Really simple language. I've tried to illustrate, for example, simple language, simple examples um, that we can all <coughs> recognise of being mindful or not mindful, but simple language. Um, practical application to everyday life. Sitting at the desk trying to study. Richard was giving lots of examples of that before, but just it's got to be directly relatable to uh, what a person is doing in their everyday life. Avoiding imposing an agenda on the participants. Um, we might have a spiritual, philosophical perspective, but if that's not where they're coming from, then I think there's a mismatch there, and, and it's not, not appropriate to impose that, although that may mature for a number of the participants. Humour, I think, always helps. So, so to put the serious and um, uh, the challenging in a humorous sort of context, it needs to be then based on experience, moving from there into the experience, and then the conversation really starts to mature. Um, and evidence-based. So, all right, so what we might do now is um, uh, perhaps we'll finish there, we've got some time maybe for questions and maybe we could just have the front lights on. <coughs> so thank you very much once again for your attention. What do you mean by spirituality? Oh, well there you go. <laughs> Um, this, one of the, the, the tutorials we have for the students um, is on spirituality. <coughs> and spirituality, as it's often defined, is a um, you know, connection to something greater than yourself, a metaphysical view of the, the universe. Uh, it's not necessarily religion or religiosity or religious commitment. For our students, we use other words as well, like where do you find meaning and purpose in your life? It can mean different things. It's often very difficult to define. Um, if the students, though, marginalise thinking, oh, say, mindfulness or meditative or contemplative practices are purely spiritual practices about, you know, some sort of metaphysical, you know, level of your own existence and so on, and, um, uh, and don't think of it as, a, as probably the most important life skill you ever learn, um, then many of the students won't engage with the process. So we do try and contextualise it in different ways. But spirituality is very hard to define, but it's, it's spirituality and religiosity, which is often what it's associated with, overlap, but they're not the same thing. You could be spiritual in some ways, but not very interested in formal religion, or very religious in some ways, but not interested, you know, not very spiritual in perhaps other ways. I could imagine it being problematic if you're trying to present this in a secular way when you talk about spirituality. Yeah, so in, a, in an introductory lecture like that, I only made a very passing reference to spirituality. Um, I made the main reference to other things. If a student asks a question in a lecture and sets that agenda, that context, then respond to the question. But I, you know, for a preaching to the unconverted sort of thing, I don't lead in, this is yeah. a spiritual practice. For me, ultimately, you know, the, Mm. It's, it's really a much deeper thing than just trying to be more focused on study. Sure. But um, I feel I've got to engage with the, mm. where the students are at yeah. and, and work from there. Mm. Yes. Hi, I actually don't work in university, but I work with um, immigration. And we run the Zinnias training, which is um, it's forced on officers who go to detention centres and work in detention centres. And I wonder if a lot of them are very sceptical um, about. If, if this was a, what I gave you the first few minutes of a one hour introduction, lots of other things would have been explored. And from that 20 different perspectives or applications of mindfulness, each one will go, oh, 
I'm interested in that. Um, oh, I'm interested in how I make decisions in a pressure situation. Oh, I'm interested in oh, how, what effect it's going to have on my health because I'm really not travelling well. So each one will choose their own way of engaging. It's just like laying it all out there. But each one will be going ping at different moments over things that are important to them. And then in the practice of it, you let people talk about it from their own perspective. One of the other things, the science of vicarious stress. If we're in the presence of somebody who's distressed and we are feeling distressed, we activate all the same stress centers and it affects how we respond to that person, that situation. Um, so it, it, in a sense, I, I've done quite a lot of work with people who are working with child welfare and people who are working with, um, you know, groups who are very much at risk and so on. And these issues of how not to take on board that vicarious stress, stress is very important. And I, I think again, you start with the evidence. If they think this is, you know, soft fuzzy kind of thing, well, why am I doing this? I, I hit them over the head with the evidence. I don't get by the end of that. Too many people saying, oh, this is a load of bollocks. It's like, oh, I didn't know any of that. Okay, and then you just gently take people into the practice and then you just see what starts to happen. So I haven't found resistance even in groups like that. I don't know, Richard, you want to add something as well to... Not to that, no. Yeah. Can I ask a practical question about, I think, the programs and less programs? Sure. Um, how do you advertise for those? Are you going out into schools? Are you getting people to come to the counselling service? So that program runs at Monash, and it's for Monash students. Um, so that's advertised across the university through the usual channels. There's uh, people that are referred by counsellors, uh, there are plasma screens and flyers around, word of mouth. And we figure that, you know, there's a growing interest in mindfulness generally. It's more and more on the screens and people are getting quite sort of excited about that. But also academic performance, mindfulness first, you know, academic success. Sorry? Do you get good numbers? We've been getting really good numbers. It's, it's, it's actually interesting. It's, it's dropped off this year because we've been changing some of the ways we've been doing it. Um, one of the things that really seems like it might help is to make a quick phone call to the students before the program and just touch base and make sure that they are aware that they're signing up for the mindfulness program that runs for five weeks. As, we've run, as we're running more and more and, and doing more with less, we're trying to cut corners wherever we can so the numbers have decreased. But last year, yeah, usually, 25 students, 15 to 25 students in each program times maybe five or six programs on each campus. So big numbers going through the courses. Uh, at, any, um, at any given time, yeah. yeah. And hundreds and hundreds of students, maybe three or four hundred students uh, learn, learn mindfulness last year um, just, through, just through the maths program. And then of course there's, there are the lectures and the, the presentations, that kind of thing. It's been about 4,000 Monash staff who have attended lectures, workshops, um, courses, trained the trainer programs in the last couple of years. Um, so it's a very high level of awareness. So an introductory one hour sort of lunchtime talk, there might be 70 or 80 people. OH&S have been wonderfully supportive, so it's it's on the conference. So there's quite a high level of awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We both do a lot of work with schools as well, consulting to schools. I, I, I get that's where, where your question is coming from. Well. Yeah. yeah. So the word's out, you know, that, that mindfulness is a really effective thing for students. And the maths program actually works really well for um, senior students, you know, BCE or HSC, whatever it is, students, they, they take to it really well. Uh, it gets really good outcomes. The biggest challenge has been to keep up with the demand in schools. Yeah. Um, that's been the main demand. Yeah. Well done, both of you, for getting this embedded into the curriculum at the university. Yes. I multi-harvard teaching, teaching lawyers like this, like the early 2000s, it is very important on the research. And I'm curious about where the next frontier is. So for example, in Massachusetts, you probably know Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, who did... Sorry, who, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> decades worth on the patient, um, the, health, the way in which patients actually with chronic pain uh, were able to demonstrate better health outcomes when they themselves were so I'm curious about whether or not there's any receptivity to the idea of doctors and medical students beginning to know how to prescribe this to their patients. Well, it's it's core curriculum. I'm not sure if you missed that part of the presentation, but every one of the more than 500 first-year medical students every year goes through a six-week mindfulness program. Um, 
then it's revisited later on when they do their general practice psychiatry units and so on. Now, we don't consider that by the end of the medical curriculum they're ready to be a mindfulness trainer. Um, they know about it, and the research we've done shows that further on in the medical course, these medical students are highly likely to be recommending mindfulness for a whole range of different clinical issues, pain, depression, mental health, and so on. So the students get it, and they're going to be recommending mindfulness to their patients. To actually be a mindfulness trainer, to be actually, you know, working with people with major anxiety or depression and other things in the clinic, I think there's another layer of training that's required. The other aspects too is in relation to performance. So they have further sessions on how mindfulness relates attention and performance. And um, <clears throat> so some of the work of Ron Epstein at uh, Rochester and um, it's been very useful in that space because it's good to have a bridge firstly about health and well-being and, and so on, uh, but that other bridge, high-level clinical skills. So we have other elements in performance and attention and so on, which sort of flesh out in a lot more than what I just sort of briefly touched on today. But, um, but they're, all, they're all aware of it and um, the vast majority of them are going to one day be recommending this to their patients. So we need some more mindfulness teachers around the place. Or... <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering about uh, depression. If you're medicated, if you're taking medication for depression, would that, how would that influence your, mind, your ability to be mindful? It's often sort of said it sort of blunts it a bit. Um, but even just being aware of that blunting is, you know, an aspect of being mindful it as well. But it blunts it, it to it. Sorry? It might enhance it first. I mean, if the person's if a person's in the really deep, very severe depression, it's not going to be very easy to engage with mindfulness at that stage. Uh, it's often when a person starts to fall out of that deep trough, and and if they're in severe depression, then antidepressants could help them with that. Um, but you know, so useful to that extent, but it can blunt it a bit. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Just that the research that's been done is. is predominantly on mindfulness-based cognitive therapy plus treatment as usual. So they're still getting therapy, they're still taking medication. This is, this is the bulk of the research. And then adding in the mindfulness component to start to identify the depressogenic thinking, which is what really reduces the relapse rate later. So yeah, I think generally it's, it's done in, in conjunction with <coughs> the existing treatment, including psychopharmacology. Okay. <coughs> Maybe one more question? Yeah. With your work with your MBA students, are you doing research and so what is the research question? We're actually not formally evaluating that, are we? Well, there is evaluation, but not yeah. what you would say, I mean... The research question. You know, yeah, we're not doing research to, to measure their decision-making ability. Or, um, but it's, yeah. there's an in-house evaluation. I, I think sometimes it's quite good to just have the first sort of year that a new program's rolling out is to do it, to sort of fine-tune it and so on, and then if going to research it, it's sort of like that's a pilot, then research certain outcomes you're interested in, then to do that once the, the program's bedded down and um, contextualised. But you probably think of some very interesting things that uh, you could research it. I was just wondering if it's funded or if it has an outcome-based approach. Yeah, it's funded. Yeah, it's funded. Yeah, it's funded. All of our elective programs we assess formally you know, and we look at depression, anxiety, stress, work engagement and mindfulness. And then from time to time we'll get students in to look at you know, people's perception of mindfulness, personality and how that predicts engagement with the program. So we, we have a sort of ongoing evaluation of the programs. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know so much we can do with the, uh, yeah. the resources and the uh, funding that we have, right. but uh, trying to do as much, stretch it as far as we can. And show our appreciation for it. Yeah.